Hi, I'm Amir Hussain Mirza Buzurg and I'm going to talk about the static general step in Abacus. This is the table of content of this video. First, I will talk about Abacus structural solvers. Then I will talk about introduction to a static general step. Then I will talk about some aspects of a static general step. Then I will talk about capabilities of a static general step in solving mechanical problems. Then I will talk about conclusion. Abacus has two structural solvers for solving mechanical and structural problems. Abacus Standard and Abacus Explicit. Abacus Standard uses implicit techniques for solving linear and nonlinear problems. Abacus Explicit uses explicit techniques for solving linear and nonlinear problems. Probably it can be said that the static general step is the most famous and practical step of Abacus. It is one of the available steps of Abacus Standard Solder. It is developed for simulating linear and nonlinear static and quasi-static problems. This step does not take the inertial effects into account. Therefore, you cannot use it for simulation of dynamic problems because inertial effects play an important role in dynamic problems. This step ignores time-dependent material effects such as creep, swelling, and viscoelasticity, but takes rate-dependent plasticity and hysteretic behavior for hyperelastic materials into account. Notice that in a problem, if the order of velocities and accelerations are small enough, you can assume that the problem is quasi-static and then use the static general step. Notice that you can use the static general step for every quasi-static mechanical problem. But in some of these problems, the use of a static general step may lead to some convergence problems like too many attempt error. And there are some strategies for solving these errors. A static general step solves this main equation. K is the global stiffness matrix, U is the vector of displacement of nodes, and F is the vector of external forces. Now I want to talk about uh, some main settings of static general step. Here I want to talk about the time period. In a static general step, the time period can be real or imaginary. If it is imaginary, its value does not affect the results. But if it is real, its value affects the results because this parameter determines the load rates and other rates in the problem. If you have defined rate-dependent plasticity or hysteretic behavior for hyperelastic materials in your model, the time period is real and it must be entered exactly. I mean that the value of time period must exactly be equal to the time period of the test or the time period of the problem in the real world. For example, if the period of the tensile test or the multipoint bending test is three seconds, here you must enter three. If the time period is real, the value of one 
means one second or one millisecond, depending on the chosen system of units. This is the axis of time of analysis, and this part belongs to step one, and this part belongs to step two. In every simulation, you must divide the problem into one or several steps and define consistent amplitudes for applied loads. The solver will divide each step into several time increments and solve each increment for the first one to the last one. Notice that in the linear static problems, there is no need for dividing each step into several time increments because there is no source of nonlinearity in the model and the problem is linear and it can be solved in one increment. But in the nonlinear problems, the solver must divide the step into several increments and solve each increment. And the number of steps depends on the physics of the problem and the sequence of loads. Now I want to talk about some main settings of incrementation of static general step. The solver will choose the time increment size according to this equation. This is minimum delta t and this is maximum delta t. And the number of increments must not reach to this value. The mathematical method of this step is in such a way that the time increments can have every value and the algorithm is unconditionally stable. This is one of the main specifics of implicit methods. Notice that the stability of the problem and the accuracy of the simulation are two different issues. In the majority of the nonlinear mechanical problems, the time increment size has a direct effect on the accuracy of the results, but even with lower accuracy, the simulation is still stable. The entered values in the incrementation tab is completely case dependent. They depend on they depend on degree of nonlinearity of the model, the applied loads in that step. If there is complex contact interaction, if there is, if there is complex contact interactions or initiation and propagation of damage in the model, the initial and maximum time increment size, I mean this value, and this value must be equal or less than 1% of time period of a step and the minimum time increment size must be this value. If the applied load is cyclic, the maximum time increment size must be less than or equal to 10% of the time period of cycles. Notice that in the cyclic problems, if you determine a value more than 10% of the time period of cycles, the loading profile that is cyclic will not affect the simulation results correctly. So, 
this amount is very so this value is very important it means that there must be it means that at least there must be five increments for each half cycle now i want to talk about this setting using this option helps to have a faster simulation with bigger time increments it decreases convergence problems the default value of this setting is appropriate and there is no need for increasing it the use of this setting in highly nonlinear problems is very very important and it helps you to have a faster simulation and have a simulation with less convergence problems. Now I want to talk about the NLGOM in a static general step. By activating this setting, Abacus will take the effects of large deformations into account. Notice that there are three sources of nonlinearity in the FE models. First, large deformations. Second, nonlinear material behavior like plasticity and hyperelasticity and damage. And third, nonlinear boundary conditions like contact. The second and third items are always taken into account by a static general step. But if you want to take the first item into account, you must activate this setting and the NLGOM must be set to on. In a simulation, if there are large deformations and you do not turn it on, the results are completely wrong because the effect of large deformations on the stiffness matrix of each element is ignored. Now, I want to talk about some capabilities of a static general step in solving mechanical problems. In this way, I want to show you some of the examples that I have solved them by using a static general step. The first one is the deep drawing process that is one of the famous metal forming processes. There are two symmetry planes in this model. So I have model quarter of the geometry.
The second example is the extrusion process that is a bulk forming process. There is an axis of symmetry in the geometry of extrusion process. So I have modeled this process in the axis symmetric space. The third example that I'm going to demonstrate it is the 2D simulation of tensile test. You can see that the necking phenomena is happening here. You can see that I have performed a damage analysis by using the static general step and this step can solve moderate nonlinear problems. Now I want to talk about the conclusions. The static general step uses implicit methods for solving linear and nonlinear mechanical problems. You can only use a static general step for a static and quasi-static simulations and if the FE model is highly nonlinear, you may encounter convergence problems. You can contact me by using Telegram or WhatsApp, or you can send email to me. These are our services. Notice that all of our services are paid services and we do not have any free services. Thank you so much for your attention and concentration. Good luck.